SMS Königsberg began its life as the lead ship of a class of four light cruisers, although more accurately probably called protected cruisers, built for the German Navy in the early half of the 1900s. With the Anglo-German naval arms race beginning to hot up somewhat, there was not as much money available to the German Navy for cruisers as they would have liked, and so the Königsberg class were designed to be able to serve both as fleet scouts and as ships for Germany's colonial stations. Ideally, they would have preferred to have a ship specifically designed for each role, but needs must meant the Königsberg class was constructed. They were relatively small ships with a displacement of about 3,500 tonnes, powered by coal and triple expansion engines driving two propellers for a top speed of about 24 knots. She carried 10 single guns, each a 105mm or 4.1 inch piece, with a pair forward, a pair aft and three on each side. A matching number of 52mm or 2 inch guns were also present along with a couple of lightweight torpedo tubes. The armour consisted of a maximum 3.1 inch or 80 mil deck plating, which is why I tend to call it a protected cruiser, as there was no belt. The ship was laid down in January 1905 and launched at the end of the year in December 1905, finally commissioning into the High Seas Fleet in April 1907. She would take part in a number of training and high status cruises, including ones that involved the Queen of the Netherlands, the Tsar of Russia, and of course the Kaiser of Germany, and she would also win particularly a Gunnery Excellence Prize during these early peacetime periods. When it wasn't all fun games and high society, she was assigned as a fleet scout for the High Seas Fleet, one of the two roles that she was designed for. The only real incident marring an otherwise fairly successful and reasonably noteworthy peacetime career was ramming the cruiser Dresden, in which both ships would take damage, but fortunately no lives were lost. By 1911, Königsberg was assigned to escort the Kaiser's yacht, the Hohenzollern, in the Mediterranean Sea during his summer voyage. But demonstrating the pace of technological advancement at this point, even though she'd only been in fleet service for four years, by mid-1911, she was already being taken out of the fleet scout role, being replaced by a newer cruiser, the Kohlberg, which was faster and slightly more heavily armed, and instead placed into a modernisation routine. Bear in mind, yes, four years after she was commissioned, she's already being modernised. Once this was done, she was placed in reserve and then into a training squadron, with the modernisation having taken a year and a half, she was now almost six years old, but already off of frontline duty. Instead, she was assigned to the other role she'd been designed for, Colonial Service, where she replaced an old, unprotected cruiser. In this respect, she was substantially better placed to protect German interests on the East African coast, as she was about 10 knots faster, had two additional guns, and all of her guns were significantly more modern and longer range, and, as we said, actually had protection for her guns and machinery spaces, which is relatively important in a battle. And so Königsberg found itself leaving Germany in late April 1914 one could say almost just in time, heading out for what they thought would be a two-year deployment to the East African station. As World War I hadn't quite broken out yet, she headed through the Mediterranean via the Suez Canal, then via Dar es Salaam, and down to German East Africa. Almost immediately upon arriving, however, Captain Luf recognised that the escalating tensions in Europe, resulting from the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, would probably lead to some form of conflict, and so he quietly scuttled back over to Dar es Salaam to make sure that he had the maximum amount of coal, shells, food, and other supplies he might need for a wartime cruise. With a primary goal of protecting German shipping in the area, the captain was hardly surprised when the Admiralty staff communicated to him, informing him that he needed to do what 
he'd already started doing. Completely by coincidence, the British Cape Colony Squadron, made up of HMS Astrea, HMS Hyacinth, and HMS Pegasus, just so happened to be wandering up the East African coast with the intention of quietly bottling up Königsberg in Dar el Salaam's port so that it couldn't do anything silly. Although Königsberg was significantly newer and indeed four knots faster than any of the British ships, Captain Luff, one, didn't want to fight a three-on-one action, and two, was also painfully aware that two of the three ships badly outclassed him, for although they were older, the Hyacinth possessed a larger battery and it was all made up of six-inch guns, sharing a similar level of protection to Königsberg and thus making her a significant threat. And whilst Astraea was a little bit smaller than Hyacinth, she was still about the same size and displacement as Königsberg, and possessed two 6-inch guns along with eight 4.7-inch guns and a range of smaller weapons, which made her about an even match for Königsberg, except for the 6-inch guns which could do significantly more damage. HMS Pegasus, however, was much less of a concern. She was a pelorus class protected cruiser, classified by the Royal Navy as a third-class vessel, i.e. one designed for colonial policing and escorting convoys against armed merchant raiders, not for action against enemy cruisers. As such, she displaced only about half as much as Königsberg, and her eight four-inch guns, although only two guns short of Königsberg's armament and theoretically of roughly the same calibre, were in fact much older designs that were significantly shorter range and had less stopping power. However, she was sailing in company with the much larger and more threatening Astraea and Hyacinth, and thus the whole force had to be recognised as an overwhelming threat. And so Captain Lurf did the only sensible thing, he got out of Dar es Salaam as fast as possible. It was only just in time as Pegasus, leading the three British cruisers, sighted him, and the three British cruisers tried to follow. However, Königsberg used her four knots of greater speed to evade the British pursuers during a rain squall. With his initial attempt to bottle in the Königsberg having failed, Rear Admiral King Hall, the commander of the Cape Colony Station, recognised that Pegasus alone could not hope to stand up to Königsberg, and so he ordered Pegasus along with Astraea to operate together, whilst the much more powerful Hyacinth would operate alone, trying to protect trade routes and hopefully encounter Königsberg as it would inevitably, they thought, come to raid British merchant shipping. Having been somewhat belatedly informed that yes, in fact, war had broken out, Königsberg swung into action action. However, her first thought wasn't to attack British merchant shipping, rather the first thought was to protect German shipping. Königsberg faced something of a problem in that whilst it had managed to leave Dar es Salaam, its collier, the König, had not, and the British exercised the power of money to buy every single scrap of coal available in every neutral port in East Africa, meaning that Königsberg couldn't call into any of those to recoal either. And so, after having radioed and or chased down every German merchant ship in the area that he could find, in order to warn them not to use the Suez Canal, as that would be easy prize money for the British, Captain Lurf then made a priority of finding more coal. On the 6th of August, this search paid off as Königsberg ran into the freighter city of Winchester, capturing it relatively easily. Lurf then took the freighter to some small remote islands in the Gulf of Oman to transfer coal from its bunkers to his own, after which he sunk the ship and sent the crew off to safety. For this purpose, he enlisted the aid of the German freighter Zietjen, which he had managed to prevent from going via the Suez Canal with an urgent radio call. However, her origins as a partial fleet scout were beginning to tell, as combined with the vast distances that make up the East African coast, coal was once again becoming critical barely a week after the capture of the city of Winchester. However, this is where Königsberg had a bit of luck. There had been a small window of opportunity for ships to leave Dar es Salaam after the British Cape Colony Squadron had chased off after Königsberg, and whilst the collier Koenig had not been able to make it out, a small steamer called Somali had. 
and she was carrying about 1,200 tonnes of coal, with a specific intention to try and resupply at Königsberg. Thus, by mid-August, the Königsberg was able to take on about 60% of the Somali's coal load, which topped it back up again, which was just as well, considering that by the time they rendezvoused, there were precisely 14 tonnes of coal left aboard the ship, which wouldn't have lost the cruiser for the rest of the day. A sweep down to Madagascar didn't find any British or French ships, and so towards the end of the month, Königsberg topped off its coal bunkers again and made for pastures new. The reason for this was that in the interim, the British warships had bombarded Dar es Salaam to destroy the German wireless station there, which combined with cutting the various telegraphic cables, left the Germans in East Africa quite in the dark as to what was going on in the wider world. Coupled with this, although he, the coal issue was somewhat resolved, Königsberg's engines needed quite a bit of work on them. Remember, Königsberg had shown up at East Africa, having voyaged all the way from Europe, and had then basically been running at combat operational tempo or near enough ever since his arrival, and therefore there hadn't been much of an opportunity to fine-tune the engines or make any minor repairs, even from the voyage to East Africa, let alone all the running around they'd done since. And so, with many British warships operating off the coast, Königsberg needed to be fighting fit, lest it slow down due to an engine casualty and be caught and destroyed that way. In this regard, Königsberg again had a little bit of fortune. A German survey ship had recently conducted a thorough hydrographical survey of the river Rufiji in Tanzania, which meant that the river Delta and the river slightly further up was fully mapped, which the Germans now had the information for, and nobody else did. And so Königsberg headed there for a bit of engine R&R, &R, on the basis that no one else could follow them up. The captain of Somali, meanwhile, was sending small steamers up the river after Königsberg to keep its coal bunkers topped off, and noticed a single British cruiser wandering up and down the coast. This was the Pegasus, although she'd been assigned to operate with Astraea, the Admiralty back in London had overruled the Cape Colony commander, telling him that Astraea and Highflyer were both needed to escort troop convoys, where their heavier guns would be very useful, and Pegasus had been left alone. This was an opportunity too good to miss, as Pegasus, being smaller even than Königsberg, could not maintain herself at sea with coal for very long, and so had to stop for coal approximately every week. As a British ship, this wasn't a major problem, as there were many friendly British ports all over the planet. However, Captain Lurf decided this was too good an opportunity to miss, and so putting the engine overhaul on hold for a minute, he directed Königsberg to head down to Zanzibar, where he calculated that Pegasus must refuel every Sunday, in order to attack it while it was in port, and then he'd head back to the river and start his major engine overhaul. And so on the 20th of September 1914, Königsberg headed towards Zanzibar, passing the small picket ship, a captured German tug, the Helmut, which, being equipped with only a single three-pounder gun and only about half as fast as Königsberg, could neither get back into the harbour quicker than the German ship, nor could it have a chance at all of stopping the Königsberg from its mission. Thus, Königsberg approached to just under 10,000 yards from Pegasus and opened fire. This is where the principle of the third-class cruiser was shown up to be exceptionally poorly thought out. Pegasus was admittedly at anchor, but even if she had had a full head of steam, she was not in any way capable of getting away from Königsberg, being four knots slower at the best of times, and at this point Pegasus's engine couldn't even manage that, and her small, short-barreled four-inch guns also had nothing like the range of the longer barrel 4.1-inch guns aboard Königsberg. So she couldn't run, she couldn't hide, and she also couldn't fight. To her credit, the Pegasus's crew did raise the white ensign and open fire, but, as we said, their guns were hopelessly outranged, so the shells splashed well short of the German ship, whilst Königsberg patrolled back and forth, quite happily peppering the Pegasus with incessant gunfire. Eventually, Pegasus's ensign was shot away, and she became holed below the waterline and started to roll over. 
Her captain ordered her colours to be struck and a white flag hoisted, thus becoming the last Royal Navy vessel to surrender in a combat action. On her way back out, Konigsberg took a few shots at the helmet, driving the crew overboard and killing one of them, although the abandoned ship was relatively easily recaptured by the British a few hours later. It wasn't all sunshine and roses, however. Konigsberg's action had been taken at the risk of its main power plant, and its engines now finally began to give out. One of the engines failed completely, and the ship limped back to the Rufiji Delta. Having found herself a nice place to relax, the crew set about dismantling parts of the engines. This was quite the complicated procedure, as the parts that needed to be rebuilt had to be taken out of the ship's engines themselves, then transported up to the top of the ship, taken out across the river to land, then transported overland to the shipyard at Dar es Salaam, and there the facilities existed to rebuild the parts in question. They could then be brought all the way back overland, shipped out to the ship, and put back in the engines again. Königsberg quickly became the centre of quite the little cottage industry, as the ship was camouflaged to prevent it being spotted, and field guns and soldiers from German East Africa were positioned to guard the approaches, along with a number of natives and Germans positioned as coastal watchers with telegraph lines which would allow them to signal if any hostile ships were spotted in the area. As it turned out, Captain Lerf's precautions were well founded, as newer cruisers of the town class began to show up on the East African coast in response to the loss of the Pegasus. Sooner or later they were going to be found, and in October it happened. The cruiser Chatham found and boarded a German merchant ship that had been supplying the Königsberg with coal, and shortly thereafter, the Dartmouth found Königsberg, along with Somali, obviously her primary collier, hiding in the Delta. As a result, Chatham, Dartmouth, along with their sister ship Weymouth, began a blockade of the Delta to make sure Königsberg couldn't get out. A single town-class cruiser outmassed Königsberg by about 20% and was armed entirely with more powerful 6-inch guns. And now there were three of them waiting for Captain Lurf. At the beginning of November, having got fed up of waiting, the British opened fire. They managed to hit Somali and set it on fire, but were unable to hit Königsberg, which withdrew even further up the river. At this point, the town class's greater size came back to bite them, as whilst Königsberg, being smaller and with a lighter draft, and of course with accurate charts of the delta, was able to manoeuvre its way further and further up the river, the heavier town class, with their deeper draft, couldn't follow. The thick mangrove forests also had a rather interesting effect of quite handily absorbing a lot of shell fire that might have otherwise been classified as a near miss, as well as affording a great deal of camouflage opportunities for the Germans to exploit. In response to this initial failure, the British began to reinforce the blockading squadron, calling in more ships from the surrounding area, including a pair of further pelorus class cruisers, presumably this time making sure they stuck close to something a little bit bigger. An old collier was brought in and sunk across one of the major outlets of the River Delta to make Konigsberg's exit a bit harder, but it was appreciated that with accurate charts, Konigsberg could quite easily take one of the other river mouths in order to escape. And so the next thing to do was obviously to bring in air support. Unfortunately, there were no Royal Naval Air Service or Royal Flying Corps aircraft in East Africa at the time, and so a quick call was put out in the surrounding British colonies. This managed to turn up one Dennis Cutler of Durban, South Africa, who happened to own a private seaplane. He was given a commission, making him a Royal Marine, and was thus persuaded to make his privately owned Curtis seaplane available for use by the British Empire. The British then happily brought in a passenger ship to serve as a tender for his aircraft, and it dutifully took off and started to patrol over German East Africa on the lookout for the Königsberg. Flying over the River Delta, he managed to get lost and had to land on a remote island. However, after being rescued, the second flight managed to find Königsberg, 
and a third flight with their Royal Navy observer as a passenger managed to confirm the ship's exact location. However, the Germans weren't going to let a foreign aircraft fly over their territory unchallenged, and ground-to-air fire successfully managed to damage the aircraft's radiator, and this meant that the aircraft was subsequently grounded until replacement parts could be brought in from another British colony, Mombasa, which for some inexplicable reason happened to carry Curtis seaplane parts. Whilst they were waiting for the spares to arrive, some Royal Naval Air Service aircraft began to show up. Unfortunately, whether they were land aircraft or seaplanes, they hadn't quite factored in the sheer amount of damp tropical moisture in the air, and between this and the heat, the glue that held these wooden canvas biplanes together began to melt, causing the planes to literally fall apart in pretty short order. All of this was having exactly the effect Captain Lurf had intended, drawing off British forces that were vastly superior to his own and forcing them all to camp out at the base of the Rivigi Delta, just in case him and the little old Königsberg happened to come out. However, the British had plenty more tricks up their sleeves, and their next attempt was to bring in the Canopus-class pre-dreadnought battleship HMS Goliath, and use its massive 12-inch guns to try and blow Königsberg clean out of the water. This would, in theory, work, except for one small problem. If the 5,000 and change ton town class couldn't get up the river, the Goliath, which weighed in at well over 10,000 tons, definitely wasn't going anywhere near that delta. And although its 12-inch guns outranged the 6-inch guns on the town class, the fact that it had to stay further out to sea meant that it too did not have the overall gun range required to reach Königsberg in its upriver hideaway. As the months rolled by and December approached, the German commander of the land operations in German East Africa, Lieutenant Colonel Paul von Leto Vorbeck, asked for as many of the crew as could be spared to come and help him in his East Africa campaign against the British, a very notably successful operation which he maintained for an exceptionally long period of time against a significant overwhelming force, which is best covered by the Great War Channel's video on the operation, which I'll link in the description below. The Königsberg was moved even further up the river in the middle of December, but with a total of 220 men left to crew the ship, there was no chance of it going to sea. Additionally, despite the crew having a bit more space to walk around in aboard the ship with the departure of so many of their shipmates, morale was deteriorating. Tropical disease, as you might expect in a tropical river delta, was beginning to take its toll, and they were completely cut off from the outside world. As we said, radio communications and telegraph cables had already been taken out by the British, and what small bits of news were getting through to German East Africa certainly weren't making it all the way into the middle of the River Delta to inform the Königsberg. As well as this, their coal, ammunition, food and medical supplies were all running low. But the Germans were nothing if not inventive. Elsewhere, they had a captured British merchant vessel. They renamed it to Kronberg, thus obviating any British charts that they might have of existing German merchant ships, since obviously it wasn't previously a German vessel. They gave it a Danish flag and the appropriate papers. They crewed it with a bunch of German sailors for obvious reasons, but they made sure that everybody could speak fluent Danish, thus helping with the disguise, and they then packed it to the brim with coal, extra guns, ammunition, and other supplies. The idea was to bypass the British blockade, using a neutral flag, and then completely restock and resupply Königsberg, as well as delivering field guns and small arms and various other supplies to the German East African land forces. This, as along with the crew aboard the Kronberg, would then allow the Königsberg to sail out and hopefully make a break for it. In order to ensure the safe arrival of the ship, Königsberg prepared to make a short sortie out of the River Delta to escort Kronberg into the, into the river. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. On her way down, it became clear that there were two cruisers waiting for Königsberg at the river entrance that it had chosen, along with a number of smaller craft, which meant that it wasn't able to proceed any further, 
Meanwhile, HMS Hyacinth, although she'd proven unable earlier to catch the Königsberg, was able to intercept the Kronberg and chase her into a bay, where the trapped ship was forced to go aground and was then scuttled. However, it must be said that the Germans once again proved to be very inventive and managed to save much of the cargo, and it helped Leto Vorbeck in his campaign in East Africa, although it obviously didn't help the Königsberg all that much. It was now April 1915, and the British had gotten quite fed up of having to maintain a small fleet off the Rufiji Delta for over half a year, on the off chance that this one small light cruiser might make an appearance. And so it was decided that a new plan was needed. This time, two monitors were to be brought in, the Mersey and the Seven. Each of them might only carry a pair of six-inch guns, but the six-inch guns both outranged and heavily outdamaged the Königsberg's 4.1-inch guns, and perhaps more critically, being monitors, they had a very shallow draft and thus could sail places that even Königsberg couldn't. By the time they arrived in July, having had to sail all the way from Britain, Königsberg had moved even further up the river. Having found some tropics-proof glue, the British now had aircraft working and intended to use these to spot the fall of shot. It all seemed to be working out perfectly until it turned out the monitors had made a navigational error and sailed further up the river than they thought they had, thus bringing them into range of Königsberg's own guns. And whilst their guns were more powerful than Königsberg's, they were small monitors and not particularly heavily protected at all. Indeed, even when combined, both Mersey and Seven displaced less, collectively, than Königsberg did. And so, when they opened fire, they found themselves counter-batteried by the German ship. Mersey was hit twice, knocking out one of its two six-inch guns and opening a hole below the waterline. Königsberg, in return, took four hits with one hole below the waterline. However, this ratio of exchange was not acceptable, and after about three hours, the two monitors disengaged and headed back downriver. Five days later, having repaired the damage, they came back again, this time navigating a bit better. Königsberg opened fire on, at 12 minutes past noon on the 11th of July, but this time with the navigation done correctly, the two monitors were very deliberate in their process, not even bothering to return fire for almost 20 minutes until they'd anchored in, sighted in their guns, and then began a steady hail of six-inch fire. Königsberg had initially been firing with four of its guns, but the amount of combat damage can be relatively easily appreciated by the fact that after about 10 minutes of British fire, three guns were in action, two minutes later two guns were in action, and about ten minutes after that, only one gun remained. With heavy casualties from the incoming six-inch shells, especially amongst the gun crews, as well as a major fire on the ship's stern, and the fact that Königsberg was now running short on ammunition, it was pretty clear the ship was not long for this world, and so Captain Leuf ordered everybody who was left to abandon ship after disabling the guns. An attempt to scuttle the ship using a couple of torpedo warheads was made, but as it turned out, being moored in a very shallow river meant that the ship simply rolled slightly to one side before settling onto the riverbed. Whilst the threat of the Königsberg had been ended, German East Africa still remained very firmly German East Africa, and so the British withdrew, satisfied that the job was finally done. However, with the wreck left there for the taking, Later on in the day, the crew returned, salvaging the ship's flag along with a number of other bits of useful equipment, including all ten of the 4.1-inch guns. These were taken to Dar es Salaam, where they were reconditioned, and they, along with the crew, were employed by Lieutenant Colonel Leto Vorbeck in his ongoing East Africa campaign, which, as we've mentioned, was very successful, especially given the odds he was facing. Indeed, Leto Vorbeck was still operating in German East Africa at the end of the war. Once the war was over, the crew would be repatriated to Germany, where they would be honoured in a parade in 1919 to celebrate their service in East Africa and also that of the Königsberg. The wreck of the Königsberg would gradually be salvaged over the next half century, although a number of other artefacts from her would be taken much earlier, with a number of guns captured during the East Africa campaign, some of which survive to this day, and 
other artifacts, such as this shell casing, which was captured from a gun from the Königsberg during a battle on during the land campaign itself, have worked their way into various people's hands. In this case, one of the subscribers to this channel kindly has let me use this picture of this particular shell case, which, as you can see, was captured in a battle in 1916. So that's it for this particular story of the uh, SMS Königsberg and its stay in East Africa. Hope you enjoyed it and hope to see you again in another video. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.